<laughs> Welcome to the Selby Courtyard. I am here with my guest, uh, Bob Cabral from Cabral Wines. Welcome, Bob. Thank you for having me, Susie. <laughs> Very yeah. well-known winemaker in Sonoma County. He's done a lot of fabulous things for our county and our industry. Um, let's start by addressing the fire situation. I know sure. everybody is wondering what's happening here, and um, we're safe. We have both been in vineyards this morning, and I believe, didn't you take a little bit of footage with your camera this I morning? Did. I, I, I did. I did. Wow. And oh, did well, I send that you to in, you? Yeah. Were you in Sebastopol? Uh, yes. So that's what we saw today. It's You can see the That snow. was actually across from Caligari's. Yeah, I was at, uh, at the I Caligari's. stopped and pulled off the road because I was watching the... The direction that plume was actually I live kind of north and uh, east of of the fires out in uh, Dry Creek and uh, that plume came over my house last night yeah. like directly over and so I was a little anxious this morning um, I know you know trying to figure out okay well where is this going and when it was blue skies I got up kind of early because I like to go in the vineyards when it's a little cooler. Well, you've always been a you morning know. guy, right? Yeah, I like to get up early. <laughs> well, so but, but it was nice to have it going yeah. kind of so to the south. We watched it go away this morning, but, yeah. um, but everything's good here, and we don't have anything to worry about except hoping that um, it doesn't come back. So things are good right yeah. now. Yeah, uh, you know, Cal Fire is going to do the best they can with oh, the yeah. equipment, and, you know, the, the, the tough part of it is it's pretty steep terrain. And, yeah, it's a... You know, it's a Tough battle, and we are getting a little bit of um, ash. Ash. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, not dandruff. But right? uh, on on the uh, positive note, we are enjoying Bob's Wildflower Sonoma Coast Riesling. Riesling, got yes. it. 2017. Yeah. Wow, I love that it has a little bit of age on it. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, because I I pick these grapes, you know, the the final pH is like 3.05. So it's got a nice wow. kind of vibrant acidity. It's delicious. I, I fermented in a concrete amphora. Uh -huh. um, all the Bob Cabral wines, as we kind of go through them today, you'll, you'll find have a very common thread in that I don't use any yeast or, you know, it's kind of lazy natural. winemaking. Well, you know? it's, um, it's minimalist winemaking. Yeah. Definitely. Cheap winemaking. No. I don't have to buy yeast. No. Well, actually, you just put your money on more important things than yeast. I would say there that. There you go. Which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, you may have noticed the title of the, the I did. episode is, it's PBR. Which actually stands for? Paps, not Paps Blue, Blue Ribbon. Blue Ribbon, right. It's <laughs> Professional Bull way, Riders. And since yeah. you are a Central Valley guy. Yeah. Yeah. That, that actually got on bulls for a while and realized so that this I, was not a I love this about that, that, that is sustainable. I, I love this about Bob's background. He he do, he did I think the first event I ever went to you and your lovely wife Heather to was a professional bull riding event. Yeah. So I love the fact that um, here you are a winemaker in wine country and you you embrace life and yeah, absolutely. love the PBR. I, I get and so excited getting to go watch bull riding. Um, <laughs> I love bull riding too. It's just, it was always my favorite part of the rodeo. <laughs> we used to go to the Senior Grand Nationals at the Cow Palace in uh -huh. San Francisco every year. And yeah, to be able to watch like three hours of just bull oh, riding yeah. is amazing. Was, wasn't there a time that you thought it'd be fun to own a stock bull? You know, when I worked with John Dyson at William Salyam, uh, we talked about raising, he's got a big ranch down in uh, Hollister uh -huh. called Vista Verde. And it's like a couple thousand acres of which maybe 1,200 is planted to grapes, but lots of grazing land. So we could we could run the bulls out there. And I thought, oh So you oh had a, a, a business plan in your head? Yeah, of... I'm thinking, oh yeah, and all these great names like Psycho and, you know, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, that's funny. I, um, Bob's I, alter ego. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I remember doing some, uh, I've met a few of the NASCAR people and there's a big bull called Boogity Boogity Boogity. Anyway, yeah. it's a, and I'm sure, I'm sure Heather's happy that you didn't go down the bull. Yeah, I, it might <laughs> have been a better path than wines, as you know. It's not necessarily yeah, it's not uh, an easy any industry. Cheaper. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, 
We're tasting your first wine. I, yeah. I will. We'll just touch on your background briefly. You're, okay. You started in Central Valley. I and did. And you worked yeah. for Bronco. Is Bronco Wine Company. Yeah, in 1980 was my first vintage. So your first yeah. vintage was the giant tanks and the. Bronco Fresno at the time was about 18 million gallons. Wow, and yeah. and Bob graduated from Fresno State yep. and, and the other school. Well, and, and honestly, let's let's go to the very beginning. Um, uh, your root, you grew up on a farm with grapes. Yeah, I did. And yeah. so you have a farming background, and it sounds like you were very hands-on with your dad, uh, Bob yeah. Senior. Yeah, yeah. I got uh, tired of actually growing grapes and almost pursued veterinary science at one time because I, I got accepted at Davis, Cal Poly, and Fresno State, and then realized uh, kind of at that moment when you're, I just turned 18 years old and realized that when I saw the course catalog, it was another eight years of schooling, and I had just finished the 12th grade. And it just seemed I wasn't, daunting. <laughs> I, I was not going to go to school for eight more years. So I really enjoyed chemistry. I really enjoyed biology. Um, are we getting another Nixle alert? Or? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, there, there's all sorts of action here in Santa yeah. County. Well, um, Bob, what I want to see is you, I know you've always been very, very hands on as a winemaker. Um, I remember at William Sullivan, I think you were typically the first one there in the morning, the last one to leave there at night. And, um, you know, I love your saying that it, a good winemaker, a good winemaker does. Um, does the right thing when people are watching, and a great winemaker does the right thing no matter what. When nobody's watching. Yeah, when yeah. you're so I in make the a cellar, sign up. You, I you actually just you don't I, take shortcuts. Right. I hung a sign at William Sallum way back in the barrel room that said, "Great, uh, good winemaking uh, is doing the right things all of the time. Great winemaking is doing all of the right things when nobody's looking." Exactly, and and, and that means not taking shortcuts yeah, in the cellar, whether your guys are there or not. And you know, it's a painful process. I mean, really, to make good wine. I know, and you sit there and go, you know, I could just walk away, <laughs> but I just don't think and, I'll sleep And tonight. go grab a cocktail at Duke's. I know. And, you know, which is what I want to do now. You know, well, I, don't. I think we have some footage of you in the cellar. which Okay. Um, in, and where was this taken? Was this... It, uh, it, I'll have to... Um, the... It, probably at three sticks. Okay, I've got a. Oh, that is a three sticks. Yeah, that's my amphora. Oh, beautiful. So um, it holds my amphora. about 150 cases of grapes. And where and is it from? Is it from Sonoma? Sonoma, yeah. Sonoma Castone. Sonoma Castone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, these are small bins. I'll pump juice over while just towards the end of fermentation. Otherwise, I usually punch them down, um, bottling. You know, we use a mobile line well, that and comes in. And this footage was taken in Last Harvest, right? Yeah, Last <laughs> so, Harvest or so the Harvest we're not before. seeing hands-on footage from 2010 or something. So no, that was really it's me, actually, yeah. It's, well, it's I make one amphora. Yeah, I make one amphora <laughs> of, of Riesling, four barrels of Chardonnay, and about 12 barrels of Pinot. Because that's about all I can really handle, you know, and do a lot <laughs> of the work myself. Be hands-on. Yeah, otherwise I'm I'm relying on the guys too much to you know, I racked my my four barrels into stainless drums yesterday at nice. at three sticks because I'm I'm going to reuse them. I leave them on the lees, but just seal them up and and I still get that kind of um surly textural component. Nice. And then I can use the barrels again. Uh, well, for this and harvest. you know, we, I'm, I'm not trying to make light of, oh, no, of William no. Sullivan at all because that was a huge job. And that you were there, didn't you? 17 vintages. Yeah, that's it. And, yeah. and really, when you got there, it, was, it had just been uh, purchased and it was going through a lot of transition. And, it was, yeah. And I'm, sh I'm sure you're instrumental in building the new winery, too. Yeah, that, you know, my, my goal at William Sullivan was to work Bert and Ed had sold the winery to John and Kathy Dyson in um, New York and my goal was to work there for maybe four or five years Bert had a consulting contract and being a big fan of William Sallium wines in the past in fact I had been on their mailing list since graduate school down in Fresno and 
it was I, I think it was I, one of those things. I think that, I recall you saying that you um, actually used part of your student loan money. I did. To buy. <laughs> I was borrowing I money that. from if anybody out there from Citibank was funding student <laughs> loans at something you, like two and a quarter percent. I was maxing out my student <laughs> loans so I could buy my wine With allocations. Wine? Yeah. I love that. So yeah. you're like a wine geek. Hey, before. but I paid it all off, forty dollars <laughs> at a time. It took me about ten years, but yeah. And so you were at William Sullivan, and they, they built their big facility, and you, yeah. you were part so of a we big went, success story, of Right. Course. They owned no facilities. They owned no vineyards. So over that, that period of time, we bought three, three vineyards. Well, we bought two properties and planted a vineyard, and then we bought a vineyard. We also built a 35,000 case winery. So when I got there, we were making maybe four, 4,500 cases. And you know how it goes. I didn't know you, it was, wow, that's pretty significant. I yeah, didn't know it was that. almost tenfold in 15 wow. years. Yeah. Wow. And that's it got to be amazing. a lot of work. That was a huge part of my thought process when I, I needed to move on, which was all good. I mean, I, I think we all left on good terms. Oh, yeah. I still see John Dyson periodically. I have cocktails with... Alan Rivera, one of the original partners, and you know, I see Jeff around. Well, and you're on a very aggressive road schedule, so I'm sure it was that nice was the for brutal part. Heather and look, pa pa Heather is obviously uh, Bob's wife, and Paige is your my daughter, daughter yeah. who's getting ready to go to college. She is, yeah. That's we drive her up to uh, Portland on Sunday so wow. she can move into the dorms at Lewis and Clark and study economics. Ooh, that's what I probably studied. the economics of why you shouldn't own PBR bulls. <laughs> yeah, and probably <laughs> and why wineries. you shouldn't own a winery. Either. Yeah, I was an so. econ major, and look where it got me. Yeah, I know. exactly. But I, you probably need to go back and take a refresher. <laughs> Maybe you and Paige could do a little yeah, homework Paige, together, right? I could be Paige's project muse, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, so it was a lot of on the road. I and, mean, I was it was like eighty hour weeks and it wasn't harvest. You know, I'd get off a plane sometimes, they'd send a driver, they'd pick me up at the airport, drive me to the winery sometimes. I would taste wines, work on blends, then take me home, and then pick me up at, I'd get home at eight or nine o'clock at night yeah, after hard. flying from the East Coast. Yeah, And then they'd schedule. pick me up at 5.30 the next morning and I'd get on another plane. You know, I didn't realize how hard traveling was until COVID hit. And oh, yeah. the only, I do enjoy not traveling anymore, but plus, you know, Paige, who goes to my, my nephew's school. Right. Uh, so you, you were, you were not traveling during her senior year and. And, and most of her high school years, you know, I mean, I was starting That's to miss nice. like, or be late for basketball games when she was at Sonoma Country Day School. And, you know, my departure was really about just gaining back time, my own time and being able to manage my mm -hmm. time. And, um, you know, really the only way to do that, because William Selling is such a machine, yeah. you know, a little bit of a hamster wheel. <laughs> and I kind of had to jump off. At it's one a big, point. expensive, and fancy hamster it's a wheel. Big, and it was awesome. <laughs> I know. Because 90% um, of the time, John would fly Heather and Paige with me. Oh, that's yeah. I knew that they traveled business with you quite a and bit. first class. I mean, Very and then nice. we would stay at the Montage in Hawaii or the Four uh -huh. Seasons in Colorado and Aspen. So we had some great times, believe me. Well, that's so perfect. You, know, you get it, yeah, you yeah. get to experience that, and now you get to experience. Well, I'm just kind of <laughs> done traveling. Yeah, you know? I know that um, goes. I was also the general manager, and you know that role. That means you're dealing with HR, payroll, marketing, mm -hmm. finance, you're doing budgets. Exactly. I hate all that stuff. That's probably why I'm not making any money on Bob Cabral <laughs> wines. <laughs> I know. And by the because way, I sell that for $75 a bottle and I'm not making any money. So, you know? <laughs> so so now, we're, now we're in real time. We've caught, we've caught people up to uh, real time. You are the uh, director of winemaking at Three Sticks. Right. So I, I have, have a consulting business. Yeah. And um, and make the Bob Cabral wines. Right. Uh, this is absolutely delicious. This is your Riesling. And um, 
Did you taste it? Oh, of course you did. Shock, your glass is empty. Shock, shock is a little empty though. Yeah, so we're gonna have to <laughs> have something in there. That's As he gets the ash out of his. Yeah. Yeah. Oh Thank my you. gosh, I am. I, I. How rude of me. But I did not. Okay. You didn't have to introduce. Who's shock? I know. I'm sorry. I, can't, that, I, I, I was sorry. stunned. I maybe like the, I was like stunned. Man, maybe the know, ash falling out of the sky it? was slightly distracting. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to take this opportunity to introduce <laughs> our industry analyst, Jacques yeah, Bricks. Yes. <laughs> but, but enjoying it, this, because I lived a couple of years in Alsace, and this is a true Riesling with that. Bob, that he's very he's snobby about Riesling. A couple yeah. of years, is that, is that what it is? That's yeah, you know, it's some of those almost kind of petrol kind yeah, of yeah. characteristics, mm -hmm. you know, from cool climate, grape growing. Um, while I whole cluster pressed it, um, I did a very long, slow press. So I wanted some skin contact, I, you know, and yeah, I, nice. you know, I just think it has a, a lot of flavor to so, it. So and, and it's not sweet. And it's, basically yeah. what Bob's saying is that uh, it, it he what he does takes a lot longer, but it it extracts more of the floral components of the grape, mm -hmm. and it it really brings out the. Um, I agree, it does have that petrol quality. It's got almost an oily texture yeah, to the, it. Yeah, you know, I was called glycol, but I have no idea. Yeah, if that's what glycol right. tastes like. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, I taste the glyc glycol every day. But I've <laughs> tasted. I've had lines bust on me, and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've had it's, that happen before. Yeah, yeah, it, it doesn't taste bad, quite honestly. No, it's actually kind of sweet. It's sweet. <laughs> it's, Weren't it's the good. Italians busted like? For it was the. Um, it was in Alsace for oh, uh, putting glycol in their wines. In their wines, yeah. Yeah, it was. It oh, was well, yeah, food that, grade. Yeah, yeah. You killed a couple of dogs. Good dogs love to lick. The it's like uh, antifreeze. <laughs> yeah, it is. Right? It's an antifreeze. Yeah. Killed a couple of dogs. Well, I don't know if a couple. But Oh, yeah. Are you Maybe trying to deflect dogs. the wine industry, <laughs> yeah. the wine industry problem? Not yes, the, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. And, and, and those beautiful little <laughs> yeah, wine uh -huh. dogs. Oh, right. well, oh I'm sure that would terrible. never happen Poor in France Fifi. today. I know Fifi. Fifi is, Fifi, yeah. Fifi is sleeping <laughs> forever. <laughs> forever. Right. So, yeah, so, um, you know, Riesling, I really it, believe that Riesling is one of those white grapes that shows its sense of place. So it really reflects its growing um, climate conditions, the soils. And the reason I call it wildflower is there's actually two vineyards in there. One is out towards Two Rock, mm -hmm. so west, southwest of Petaluma. And that comes in even later than, than so the place a very, on That's Occidental. a cool climate area in it's, it's Sonoma cold County. Out there. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's flat out cold. <laughs> it's, it's cold, like you shouldn't really be growing grapes out there. And then I was serious about why I you know, why I charge so much is I'm paying my growers extra. Riesling in Sonoma County would average maybe $1,500, $2,000 a ton. And I'm paying these guys $5,000. Which, which is not, which is low. Like yeah. the, the average Sonoma County would be uh, maybe 2500 yeah. 2800 something like that. Pinot, more like 3500 or something like oh, that. Oh yeah, it's a yeah. It's way, but, but so you, you pay them more, do you do it for lower yields or do you do it for other farming uh, All reasons? the above, yeah. Um, not to use any glycophosphates. You know, I, um, the, the place out in, um, in Two Rock or West Petaluma uh, is organically farmed just because that's how he believes in caring for his vineyard and I'm totally on board. But that means a lot of extra labor. Yeah. So you're hoeing weeds. I mean, it's easy to get the sprayer out, and well, you, you know, can... and I get it. I grew up growing growing grapes, and I I helped manage the the vineyards with Chris Boland's help at at William Selium, and he and I tried all kinds of different ways of getting away from like Roundup right. and Chateau. Did you ever try the little goats or anything like that? We we. <laughs> No, because we didn't have, we weren't able to contain them, okay. and I was keeping the the heads kind of low on our on our cordons, but we used you know propane yeah. burners and uh, sunflowers and star wheels, and a lot of it was just hand hoeing. And uh, Chris, Chris Boland was on a show earlier, so he's he's yeah. the, sort of the Selby 
celebrity vineyard vineyard manager, manager yeah did um <laughs> did you ever do biodynamic things with chris we talked about it you know i i got bored uh around 2013 14 and i started <laughs> rereading um uh the biodynamic book it, it has a logical basis it, it it's does. just a little crazy when you start practicing it well yeah it's like <laughs> it's like reading ancient chinese history or something it's yeah. just it's it, it's it's got a sense but it's <laughs> it just takes away. I, I remember one of chris's uh, vineyards had they were hanging uh irish spring soap around the perimeter to keep deer away deer away yeah. and what happened Oops. is chris went yeah. back to check the to check and the there were bites taken out of the, the soap, soap by the deer yeah <laughs> they were just it, yeah. it was crazy but, it, but anyway. no you i mean we tried all it's kinds of things but what we did realize when we were able to farm a completely separate block with no herbicides at william Salyam <clears throat> for about seven or eight years uh, the cost was almost 500 times more than, or 500%, yeah, yeah, yeah. 500%. Oh, wow. So if it cost you $300 an acre to spray Roundup, it was more like $1,500 an acre to hand hoe right. and, and keep the weeds down. So, you know, I figured to get the growers to do this and just, right. you know. You're being fair. I think we all need to take a look at what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and are we, are we being sensitive to the environment? Are we leaving a better place than what we came into? And I, I don't, I can't say yes to that all the yeah, time. Yeah, but and, that's it. You know, that's it. It's, it's, it's more of a kind of a personal philosophy. Yeah. So. Well, but that's also what will sustain our county for more yeah. generations, and I'm sure you're yeah. sensitive to generational. And that's the thing is, you know, people are going to want to pass these vineyards on to their kids, right. and you know. Well, and um, having grown up on a vineyard. Yeah, and I saw in the '70s what you know. I mean, you, the, there were PCAs out there that when they saw a bug, it was like spray this and then five more bugs would show up because you killed everything yes, and then the it was spray this people. and then pretty soon we were it was just spray after spray yeah and when i got to college we realized that we were killing a, a natural part of the ecosystem so if you could target things a little bit more like some of the fungicides now we're actually spraying right uh, chris Rusi's uh uh segment here he talked yes. a lot about you yeah. know how he sprays basically a fungus to kill a f another fungus. Yes, it just overpowers it. Exactly. So, so you, you don't want residual damage. Basically, no. You want to you want to be kind of sensitive, and you know water is really um, an important resource here in California, and we don't right. want to be putting things into the aquifers that that we're then going to pump back out and drink mm -hmm. or clean our tanks with exactly. or and bathe our kids and in. And speaking of water, I assume yeah, that's what's in it your... It is water. <laughs> Actually, it's straight vodka, but so it's on I... ice. Don't worry. It's ice cold. So why don't we why don't yeah, I we think taste, it's Chardonnay time, isn't it? Why don't it? we taste your next wine? <laughs> yeah. And um, if you hand me that, sure. I'd be happy to pour. And I think that it would be... Look. Wrong one. Very down. fun to talk about our, our prop we have today on the table. Well, this is what is called a rat to cob. So- Excuse me while I that's okay. cover up our prop. The candle, here, yeah, I gotta pour Jacques some too. Yes, I know, Thank he's, you. Yes, he's I know looking us. a little anxious. Anybody in the peanut gallery <laughs> need some? I'll pass it on. Okay, yes. Then we need, to, we need to come back. Yes, the, our, our, our fans. <laughs> Our fans would like some well, Chardonnay. This slipped yeah. off, Rob, so I'm just going to clip it here now. So, um, what vintage is the Chardonnay? I did not. Uh, 2016, my 16. current vintage. Yeah. Again, uh, I love the 16 vintage. I'm, I'm, I'm making wine. I'm releasing the wines as I feel they should be released. Which is, and, yeah, which is and, a good reason to own yeah, your brand. You can do that. Exactly, and again, it's it's like 90 to 100 cases. Uh, this retails for $100 a bottle. And we'll get into the pricing and kind of what, what the brand is, is all about. Um, but mm. like Cuvée Wildflower, because I don't own the vineyards, I didn't want a single vineyard to wow. wine. Um, 
because I'm not guaranteed, even with contracts, they can they can break the contracts, and you don't necessarily get the vineyard, especially after you've gotten a big score on them, or they jack uh, oh, the price yeah. up. Yeah, they, I've had that they, they steal them. I, yeah. yeah, you know how that goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in the case of Chardonnay, this are, these are two vineyards out in Occidental and Freestone, and it's a cuvee, so I have a cuvee line. If I do come out with a single vineyard, it'll say single vineyard and then whatever that ranch happens to be. Um, it's a single vi um, cuvee called Anne Rose. Um, that is Heather's middle name and Paige's middle name. Oh, you know, so I knew that I it named was going to be a combination after, of... after my girls. Oh. And uh, it's 100% barrel fermented. Uh, it's kind of in the style a it's little lovely. bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, not as big yeah. and yeah. rich as like a, you know, something from Montrachet yeah. or Batar, yeah. but you know, a little bit leaner, maybe more towards Chablis. Yeah, so a it. lot more acidity to it. Hmm. I mean that that's beautiful wine. I, mean, I think it has a little bit of a Montrachet it, it, quality. Yeah, well, it's too. starting to Organic. develop the it, the textural it, part it, of the you, wine. Yeah, in the middle of it's got great mouthfeel. Yeah, it's a little bit of the fatness that's minerality. It's really nice. It's Again, beautiful. no no stirring, but like one brand new barrel, one once used, twice used, three times used, and then I don't rack it. It goes into the drums, sits there for three and a half months. So basically, into Bob the ma makes makes the wine. Uh, puts it into barrel and goes on vacation and, and yeah. goes on and leaves <laughs> <laughs> and goes on vacation well, we for three better. months. That right. work like that, yeah. <laughs> so um, this wine actually went into the bottle unfiltered. You can kind of see it's got a little bit of an opaqueness to it, so it's not well, quite have, crystal clear. And, you and have I'm to have, okay with that. To, to have unfiltered wines, one of the reasons you don't see them frequently is because it has to be a 100% clean perfect wine in order to do that um, so you don't have to worry about re-fermentation or any problems right. in the bottle. Right, no residual so it's sugar, a, no malate. It's a big, yeah. it's a big thing. It's tough so to do. You, you have to be very clean and very uh, perfect and make sure everything it's, goes yeah. away, behaves well. Yeah, and sometimes they, you get the problem children. And, uh, my 2017, I had uh, two barrels that didn't finish um, alcoholic fermentation. So in February, there was still 32 grams of residual sugar. Wow. And it finished in May. It would, so that means, that means that Bob is not I almost had adding any wine. sulfur. <laughs> no, He's it not had nothing, doing, yeah. You can't do anything. Yeah. In order, in, so in order for wines to complete their fermentation, whether it's primary or secondary, you yeah. can't do anything to protect the wine. You just have to hope but you, you obviously you had such clean fruit and yeah, and the cellar was at the right temperature. Wow. That's and making me sweat just thinking yeah. about it. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's a, you're a braver man than me. That's it was impressive. two barrels though, so know. you know, I wow. was like, if I got to drink them myself, that that's that's also my my part of my marketing plan is that if. If you don't want to pay the hundred bucks, I'll just drink them. That's myself, funny. So. I know that that was what my dad and I said for me. Very, like your only backup plan with wine is you, 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 just you make it. what you like yeah. because you're gonna you're gonna have to drink it. Exactly. And at least there is a backup plan. That you know, is you the know, backup we're, plan. We're in a good industry for backup plans for sure. And at a hundred cases, that's you know that's not bad. Well, this is it's at, like a case every three days. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Yes, yeah. and what's your point? Right? <laughs> right? See, Jacques like, okay, well, that's that's, that's still that's under normal. the French, yeah, exactly. uh, the, the <laughs> French per French capita threshold. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah, isn't good. this isn't this beautiful? <laughs> that is. You know, yeah, really, really nice Grand vineyards. Grand quality, you know, and it is. Grand Cree is all three hundred bucks. You know, and if you can get them. So I agree. Well, it's been. Um, I've just kind of started sending it out to the writers, and yeah, they've. You know, 94s, 95s, 96s is kind of what has been the standard, yeah. So that's kind of nice. I think that the public likes to see those scores sometimes. You, you know how it is. Um, I don't think we, did we get distracted? We didn't get to the uh, We did, the well, that's because we're, we're worried about our fans having plenty of wine. And Jock, <laughs> and he, he hadn't been in, introduced yet. I know, so. God, Jock. Yeah. so left out. Oh, is yeah. he here? But I love that. 
Yeah. Okay, okay, back so to So the Ratnikov, how that came about is I was bring move the oh, here. Okay, how's Actually, that? let's yeah. move it forward. Oh, there we go. Front and center. The Rat de Cob, uh, is actually a very crucial winemaking tool that was used during the 10th century by the um, monks of the Cluny of Abbey in Vougeot. So they used these candlestick holders to uh, rack the wines, to work in the caves. Most importantly, during fermentation, when the flame would start to turn blue and go out, they knew there was too much gas build up in the caves and they needed to leave or so it was kind of their canary. Yeah. <laughs> so as I was establishing this brand, I was trying to think of, you know, the techniques I would use. I've been making wine for almost forty years by the time I started this. And I was always fascinated with these these little it's it's just one piece of metal that's that had to have been hand forged and they the candle just moves up or down with this little, oh, little wow. cup and in there. So it's a very simple tool, but again, very crucial because you didn't have electricity and you didn't want to burn other kind of fuels in there to, to give yourself right. light because it would give off a smell and into the wine. No, that's, that's amazing. So I started bringing these home from Burgundy when I would go home, go back to France. And um, it's actually what's on the top of my capsule. So if you put the bottles in your cellar, you'll see the little rat to cob. Do you, do you have a collection of these? Say, I've got, small? yeah, probably different sizes. Yes. We've used a few <laughs> here and there. Heather's um, nodding. His wife's nodding. Yeah, she's like. <laughs> yep. Um, I love And then, that. yeah, I just, I bring a, a few back every time you stuff them in the suitcase. And well, it's a, it's a really, uh, it's a wonderful reflection of, of the history of wine, and the history of wine is one of the, you know, greatest things about it. It is. It's crazy. Truly. It's been in our culture literally for thousands of years. Yeah, it's thousands, you know? thousands of years of fermentation. So I love that. I love that. So that was kind of going to, or that was going to be my, my signature a little bit, um, and my ode to kind of old world techniques mm -hmm. of winemaking. So... Well, I, we were joking be before we, we came on it, you know, as lazy winemaking. It's just basically hands off. Well, yeah. It's Spending the time out in the vineyard, getting really, really good grapes. You know how it is. It's like when you're cooking at home. If you start off with really good, yeah, good fish or exactly. really good tomatoes, you end up making something usually pretty good. Same thing with winemaking. Well, and I, I, when I was referencing earlier that you, instead of worrying about yeast and, and uh, putting things in wines, you're focusing on, on the quality of the grapes. And I, I am fascinated to see, um, I think we have some uh, footage or information on your how oh, you barrels. choose barrels. Yeah. Yeah. And, and barrels is something we haven't really touched on very much, Shock. During, I think during we had one barrel no, it was distributor. Corks. It was oh, corks. It was, cork. right. it was corks. Sorry. Yeah, never mind. Neil Foster, <laughs> never mind. right? Yeah. <laughs> Chuck, there's a reason I don't introduce you. I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. No, no. Right. But, but so tell us about your, your how you choose your barrels. So and, a lot and, of it is And just I'm going to start by saying this is not something that's typical in the wine industry. No, but no. But I, I was asked as I was leaving William Selyam, uh, we have some footage here I believe now of some trees. So for the last six years I've been going to France uh, in the winter and uh, working with a harvester and a stave mill producer. So they buy a plot of land or they buy a series of trees from the, the French government and then we go in and flag the barrels that, or the trees that we want to have our barrels made from. And so the, this is Nicolas Gautier. He's a fifth generation stave mill producer. That, this is down in Marys of Bois. So it's about three and a half hours south of uh, Paris, a little bit southeast of Paris. Um, you're almost to the Loire Valley. Okay, this yeah. is actually at Dargo Jagla in Romanish Tarans. Uh -huh. So traditionally a barrel has its staves brought together by using dry heat or a flame. 
Dargo Jagla actually submerses the barrel in steam in water for 20 boiling water for 20 minutes and then brings and, and pulls that flour together and puts the coopering hoops on. Then the, it goes to the toasting room where it's a series of six to eight toasting pots and they sit on there. The flames are at varying heights and varying intensities and you keep moving the barrels over these pots. Yeah. So I'm there literally smelling the barrels it as we're toasting good. them. It and it smells really good. And you get to a point where you go, okay, oh, let's stop. So you're let's actually stop. choosing wow. the toast level based yeah, on I, sensory from evaluation? From Tonelia Rio, wow. I custom toast about 35 to 40 barrels for three sticks. I do about six for Bob Cabral wines. And I now have another client uh, that I'm doing the same thing for. About uh, we did about 25 wow. girls this year. That's fascinating. Yeah. I, have you? I assume you've been to that part of France, of yeah, course. Yeah, I was born near Cognac. Okay. Which is yeah. A lot of the big forests and a right. lot of the. So the you're near. Yeah. Are there. So we were originally buying wood from Aligny, uh, Chateau Roux. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Where you know, are. center of France, so yeah. Nevers, so, yeah. uh, Limousin is there, yeah, you know, right. yeah. uh, Allier, Troncé, mm -hmm. kind of a, a, a narrow mountain in the middle of, of yeah. um, Limous or in, in the middle of Nevers. I've been kind of fascinated though, the last couple of years. We were able to go up to the Vosges Mountains near Alsace, so near yeah. the town of Darnay. Yeah. And so it's not really super steep mountains, but it's at a high elevation. And we were there in 2017, and it started snowing, and these snowflakes were like the size of a quarter. And I, ha I actually took quite a bit of footage. This, and it snowed on us for like 40 minutes while Nicholas had one of his professors from the university, the uh, forestry uni university, that he had wow. to go to for seven years to study, to be able to buy trees. Wow. Yeah, yes. it's it's crazy. But these this Vosges wood has a, a spice element to it, especially when you do a long, slow toast that I really like. And I, I think I'm gonna start using it in Chardonnay, uh, in my Chardonnay. I use it a lot on the, the three stick Chardonnays, but I love it in my Pinot. Now, are you mixing the wood within the barrels themselves? No, it's you're, it's a hundred percent from keeping that. Because if you buy that tree, if you're lucky, you can sometimes get if, eight barrels yeah. out of like one tree. I didn't know if you were blending trees. You were no. choosing trees. Wow, that is no. so interesting. Honestly, and so what time of year? Like it, we would, go, like you don't want to harvest trees much after about the first week of March. So because you, the sap starts to go up into the trees, you want them dormant yeah, when you're. Yeah. So November to. Mm -hmm. But it's cold. I mean, like I said, it was <laughs> snowing. I lived there. Nobody well, likes France a complainer, cold Bob. anyway, right? <laughs> and I mean, but it is cold, cold. And you're out in these <laughs> forests, and I've got wool coats on, and mittens, and scarves, and I'm still cold. And we've been drinking all morning, and I'm still cold. So um, while it's a great program, uh, and I love doing this, and so the wood gets shipped to Tonelli Rio in Benicia. Uh -huh. So about the middle of uh, June, we were down there for almost two full days, In Benicia, just smelling just... barrels um, oh, while wow. they while they were. So you come already all finished. No, right? no, no, no. It's no? just the staves. Just the staves. Yeah. Okay. So you choose the you choose the trees. The staves come to California. Staves stay in France for three years. Oh, because they're air dried. They're air dried, and then and that, that's a big thing in the barrel industry. Well, and air then dried I'm paying to have it restacked every six months, so they unstack. Are you paying extra for that? Yes, I am. <laughs> These barrels are $1,700 a barrel. Oh, wow. Yeah, whereas you can get a really good Francois for like 900 bucks. Nine, 956. Yeah, so exactly. $6 <laughs> Give or take a few dollars. Of oak. Yeah, Six you know, um, <laughs> but <laughs> you are making barrels that yeah. nobody else yep, can get. Absolutely. You know, it's it's a very sure. unique, unique pro program. And three sticks, it makes up about a third of our oak profile now. And, you know, we've had some great successes in like five years well, of being there. So. Th that's one of the reasons this tastes like a Montrachet. Right. I mean, it's, yeah, you know, it's beautiful. You want to be choosing barrels that are going to complement the fruit, not 
Barrels to me need to be like salt and pepper or mm -hmm. an herb that will bring out whatever kind of mother nature is giving you. Mm, yeah. Well, it's, that's, that's pretty fascinating. I'm laughing. I'm, I'm like, you know, I, I think in one of the shows I was talking about um, my Missouri oak barrels where they sent the Christmas card and everybody had squirrels in their pockets. <laughs> they were raising pet squirrels. It's, it's a little different environment in Missouri than it, it is in it the is. center of France. But, I, but. Bought a, I bought a lot of oak from Missouri. And, and actually I even, like that for American oak. Yeah, no, they're, they're great American oak barrels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, what is the next wine? So we have we, uh, the only, I only make three, so here's the uh, oh, the last. Like the Troubadour. The Troubadour Pinot, yes. Because I, now I'm, I do not know, and I'm very interested to hear how you came up with the name, and I assume that your interest in history. History and music. 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 So and a Troubadour was uh, typically thought of as a uh, kind of a, uh, a storyteller. Sort of a poet, right? A poet that would kind of uh, sometimes sing or speak his way through the countryside. And, and wasn't it a prestigious position within the... It, it, it was. You were, you were seen, I, you know, and an guys art, like Bob artist. Dylan have been called the, you know, <laughs> a folk yeah. troubadour. To, I watched a documentary on Bob Dylan here recently and it, it was folk troubadour to rock star. And, and it was kind of funny because I really resonated with the folk troubadour um, actually aspect of his career. I'm not a big fan of his rock stardom music compared to his, his folk troubadour. So I named it Troubadour again. This is four vineyards out in the Russian River Valley, kind of out towards Sebastopol, Burnside Road, um, very cool area. I don't bring most of this fruit until late September. And you said it's four vineyards? It's four, three to four different vineyards, yeah. Do you, do you share this with other wine makers? I do, and yeah. then do Well, I have one main vineyard that I, only I get it, yeah. And then, but you have your, usually what happens is uh, winemakers have their section, and even within your section, you can work with the grower to choose what they're going to do in Especially years. Especially you pay them. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm acting casual. Yeah. I know. It so, helps. Yeah. <laughs> it helps a little so bit. So the Troubadour is uh, the retail price is 125. Yeah. And this is the 2016, 2016. as well. Yeah. That is one of my favorite. So Pino just vintages. release. You know. Um, yeah. Let's try it. What, are you up for it, Shock? <laughs> <laughs> His glass has been well, empty. Well, it's been, yeah, it's evaporated. After, Whatever was in after there. I poured the Chardonnay, it was like, <laughs> it's gone. Oh my gosh, our fans over there are, are hoping I here. I'm, I apologize, I'm praying for myself and passing it on. There the, you go. The, the peanut gallery over there, right? The, oh, yeah, yeah, it's the Pinot gallery. <laughs> Pinot the gallery. Pinot gallery. Yes. Yes. No, that's not the they're, Pinot, they're Pinot gallery. Their, they're shaking yeah. their glasses. Right. So. So um, uh, a little bit about how I how I do this uh, open top fermenters. Um, I use oh. thirty to maybe forty mm. percent whole cluster. So that's a technique of not destemming the fruit. Yeah, we've probably talked about it a couple of times on the on the uh, show, um, and that you get that carbonic maceration, so it gives it a very high tone fruits. That kind of cherry. Yeah, that means raspberry. he's just taking the clusters and obviously, and you use native yeast, so you're just yeah. letting, so you're just taking clusters of fruit and letting it ferment naturally. Do you? I, I put you, the clusters you, on the bottom of the fermenters, uh -huh. and then I destem the other mm -hmm. seventy percent on top. Hold it with dry ice. I try to hold it six, seven days if I can. Oh, he, this is a brave winemaker. I'm too you know, neurotic to You just do let that all stuff. of those. Well. What happens is, and here's how I equate it. I, I if you it. take a banana, <laughs> you buy them in the grocery store, they're green, right? They yeah. taste kind of hard. There's not a ton of flavor to them. Put them on the counter. A week, they turn kind of yellow. Another week, they start spotting, but they get softer and they get sweeter. And the intensity of the flavor comes out. By the time it's the, the peel turns black, you're ready to make banana bread, but yes. it's almost mush because the enzymes have taken long chain sugars and flavors and cleaved them down to glucose and fructose. So you do end up sometimes with a little bit higher alcohols, you know, even though I'm picking maybe at like bricks of 23, 23, 5, 
they'll hit into the low 14. Well, and it's because the conversion rate is yeah, different. Yeah, is, is, is So a the lot way different. Bob makes wine, he's he's picking at lower bricks, but it does convert to a little bit higher alcohol. But yeah. but it's also, I, I don't know quite how to explain this other than to say you're you're doing things, even though it's more simple, it's a lot more stressful. You're, you're oh, not for me. I just like. <laughs> but you're 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 doing everything. Um, you're taking more chances, and you're coming a lot out of chances, with yeah. Because things very, go it's wrong. Ri- it's quick. risky winemaking, yeah. and he's coming out with a superior product. Yeah. So it's that's, it's fabulous. He's successfully orchestrating risky moves. Let's so the sweeter it as fruit that. is at the end of the branch. Yes. Right. <laughs> so. I'm kind of leaning off that ladder a lot, just about ready to tumble over. So I will punch them down maybe three or four times during active fermentation. I like them to get hot. He means three or four times a day. Three or I'm sorry, three or four times a day, yeah. Yes. So for like maybe three days, because Pinot goes fast. Um, Yeah, it does. Temperatures will get up into the low 90s. And you're doing half ton bin? Uh, I have as big, large as five ton fermenters. Oh, so you yeah. are? Okay. Because I do make a little extra wine for Dustin Vallette. So I make oh, his nice. uh, Vallette Pinot and our, his Rosé. One know. of our favorite restaurants yeah, in Yeah, Dustin. Hillsburg. Here's to Dustin. He's such yeah, a good guy. Yeah, he is. Know. We'll raise our glass. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right? Shock. We hope we su- he's in fact, surviving. I'm right. a little disappointed that he didn't just drop off a charcuterie pay- plate here. <laughs> today, right? I just could have made the no, phone call. It's my fault I didn't call him. I, I, I have. I, I have something, I have something Jacques, organized not to worry about. Now I know why fans. she forgot to introduce you. I know. I'm just you forgot to, you forgot to call <laughs> Dustin. But that's, yeah. that's a beautiful It is lovely. Yeah, and that's a uh, fun wine. I have one main vineyard and then basically I take barrels that don't make Troubadour taste like really great in my mind and I put it into Dustin's wine. And yeah, it makes a great <laughs> bottle of, of so, wine. Oh, so Dustin gets whatever. He gets the declassified, if you will. That's <laughs> funny. You know, I used to I used to make wine for Robert Redford, and I would do that. It'd be Selby, Robert yeah. Redford, and then Dan Marino would get whatever's left whatever over. Whatever was left over. I mean, <laughs> no, it's you just, know, it's funny how he you never <laughs> won a Super Bowl or anything. I never so got a on. Super Bowl ring. Right? That was my. <laughs> I used to joke around. He didn't get the ring. Yeah. He gets the la- third tier. But, well, this. How many cases do you make? So this will vary from about 225 to maybe 275, yeah. Now, there is one wine. You have American Girl, don't you? Oh, I made a rosé in 2016, actually, it, but it's... But isn't that name? I for, sold that for 75 bucks a bottle, too. Good for you. Yeah, crazy. It's not crazy. But it was it's fermented on the skins. I did a partial barrel ferment. That <laughs> wine was a pain in the... Side. Wasn't it named after your daughter? Or is no, that just my um, own image? No. It'd be Ameri- no, it was, Girl, it was it's a, a Tom Petty song. And it was a little bit of a slam against the insipid French rosés yes. that were out there. Oh. So this had color and partial mallow, a little bit of tannin, a oh, so you were, you were, little bit of oak. So I was, I was oh, so dissing were, the French. Oh, good for you. Mainly Provence. How, how do you feel about that, shock? Oh, I'm, I'm over you. <laughs> You're right. I, mean, I wanted something that actually had some flavors yes, to it. Absolutely. That actually I could chill had it flavor. Down. You know, you chill. And still well, taste it. You know, I've made the Sunye. The bleeds are just kind of sugar water with a little bit of color. I didn't want that. Except for the Selby, of course. Except for the Selby, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I know. Right? Except for that, but all the rest, for sure. Um, oh, that's funny. How about that you did hey, that? I, I well, even a, like Dustin's, I, I, I no, just, Dustin's rosé, I back blend um, 10% of his dry red wine into it. And I think that makes all the difference. So in, he bleeds the rosé and then he takes uh, uh, fermented red wine. Right. That's to already give it more been, flavor. Uh, right. And add color and stuff like that. And just, it, yeah. yeah, some yeah. mouthfeel mouth and feel, texture yeah. and yeah. I'm so. just paying my dues here since on my way here, I just picked a couple of grapes. Just to show everybody that a couple which, of Pinot Noirs. That's well, I'm not sure. No, I know I'm not these sure. look awful big. But did you this go? Did said, you trespass into somebody's vineyard? No, it's vineyard? right around my house. <laughs> and thank you, uh, thank you to uh, Diane Wilson, who was here on the show oh, yeah. two or three weeks ago. Oh, that's yeah, from I saw her vineyard. Diane's, uh, and so, yeah, that's like more like. But that's Zoom. what's happening right now. The grapes are pretty close, right? Because they. Yeah, a couple yeah. weeks. Well, it's it's an early yeah. harvest. 
Wait, yeah, oops. I mean, so it that. is for me you know, so far. Right now, the sugars are kind of rising and the flavors aren't. So I was on the phone actually in your living room talking to somebody like just chillax. You mean in the green room? In the green room, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then before that, I was on a call to the winemakers at Three Sticks that, you know, we your, were going in your, over. In your some, limo on your way over here? In my, in my yeah, <laughs> as I drove us over yeah. here. Yeah, so what's the Three Sticks about? So Three Sticks um, was a um, partnership with Bill Price, and, you know, it was kind of a hobby of his up until uh, he hired Ryan Pritchard, who had worked for me in 2008, hired Ryan as the assistant winemaker. I came on as director of winemaking. And it was to just kind of revamp uh, their style a little bit and work with the vineyards. Bill, at Three Sticks, we buy literally, I think it's 97% of the grape. We only have one outside grower. Bill Price owns all the vineyards that go into the Three Sticks wines. Oh, that's nice. And the re what intrigued me about working with Bill was that my biggest successes at William Salyam were actually with the estate vineyards, yeah. where I had more control yeah. with Chris. Uh -huh. Chris and I'd go out there and I'd go, well, what if we did this? And sometimes he'd go, you're crazy, we're not doing that. Or he'd go, sure, let's try it. So, you know, Chris grew the 100 point wine. A lot of people give me all this credit for blending or fermenting this 100 point Pinot Noir. But Chris grew that well, fruit that, for that's, me, that's part and of that your, was huge. That's part of you your know? original philosophy that we started with. You're saying we, you start with great ingredients, you start with good fruit, and then you do as little as possible to do anything other than enhance it. Exactly, and you know, I think we, we the one thing Burt Williams really taught me about making Pinot was being patient. And when you see a problem in Pinot, it's not necessarily a problem, it's more like a phase. You know, like the problem, it's, it's like a child that's all of a sudden, you know, sneaking out to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. Give them a whole pack, let them smoke it all at one time, throw <laughs> up, they'll never smoke again. <laughs> with with, with Pinot Noir, you just want to, you just want to leave and you, it. And you can't ground it, so. You, you can't just, ground it. You just let it do what it needs to do. Right. To so young phases. winemakers, as young winemakers, we all tend to want to fix everything. Yeah. And sometimes wine doesn't necessarily need to be fixed. Well, you know, it's unusual. Um, tell me if you agree with the shock. Is, uh, Fresno State is such a technical school as opposed to Davis, which is more of a, a theoretical school. You know, you, you were yeah. very hands-on from what I... We were, yeah. And um, it's very unusual for Fresno uh, graduates to come out and not want to be more technical. Right. You know, you've got a, an unusual approach based on... It's not a bad thing at all, but it, it's no. like a desire to... To be as technical as possible and, and interfere. Well, because you want to, um, you want to use your degree. Right, and of course, I, my degree is in economics, so, so. I, there's no pressure here. <laughs> Out the window, <laughs> exactly. Right? Who cares? Yeah. I know. It's like if it doesn't taste good, it's not my fault. I wasn't trained. Right. So. <laughs> exactly. Right? Nobody ever taught me. Okay. So um, I, I'm moving on because th this is what I love. So uh, some people might think that you were very fortunate. Um, I very believe fortunate. that you were a very hard worker. You made some fabulous wines. You rose to um, a position where you had exposure to interesting people. But yeah. what I love about that is that you fully took advantage of your exposure to interesting people and your love for music. And, I did. Um, yeah. and a lot of people wouldn't have done that. And, and how, yeah, how I met some really interesting people, and, and it was like all of a sudden you're, you're bringing wine, you're being walked into a venue backstage with two six packs of wine, and then <laughs> and, and they get excited Def Leppard's opening for Journey, and you're drinking <laughs> wine with the keyboard player at well, Journey. I think you know? it helps and that you were showing up with good wine, and they were. No, you, you, you and, and realize you, that. And that's why I said superstar. So you're sort of the yeah. rock star of winemaking. Oh, there we go. Here we have some. So food. yeah, you meet a lot of celebrity chefs. Uh, Emeril Lagasse, uh, Guy Fieri, great guy. Yeah. This is. Um, Cliff Williams, the bass player from ACDC. This was at a benefit down at the Fillmore about a year ago. A year uh, ago? Wow. Yeah, for um, 
for pediatric cancer research at UCSF Benioff. And Sammy put it on, and there's Michael Anthony, and we were, they wanted these promo like a, pictures of Santo, like his tequila. Uh, <laughs> this is with Sammy and the drummer Trey Cool from, that's Paige, with Trey Cool from uh, Green Day. Oh, and then this is backstage at one of Sam's shows, and you know Don and Henley. That's Heather or, and Paige. Yeah, and Don Bob. Felder's back there. He had opened up for for Sam at that show, and you know I loved the Eagles growing up and that kind of country <laughs> rock, and so all of a sudden you're meeting. I don't know if they're necessarily your heroes, but it's it's your generational yeah, music. But, but you were a, you were a fan. I mean, you were oh, into huge that, fan. and then yeah. had, had, how did how did your relationship with Sammy Hagar? You know, em Emeril develop. introduced me to him, and Emeril's a chef. Yeah, Emeril Lagasse, so and and, <laughs> and uh, I'd been doing some charity work with Emeril, and <laughs> literally he came out to do an auction lot at William Salyum, and I get this call. And it was Emerald. And he said, hey, you need to come down. Bistro Ralph's was open at the time. And he goes, I got somebody that wants to meet you. Bring some wine. And so I'm like, well, crap, I'm in the middle of working. And, you know, like I got a real job here. You know, I'm, I'm not just doing the auction lot tonight. I've got a 10-hour job that I got to go to before I, I do this auction lot. So then Heather calls me and says, you better get your butt down here and make it quick. So I get down there, I, I come down, I finish up what I'm doing, I grab a couple six packs of wine, and I'm walking up to Bistro Ralph, and there in, the, in one of the parking stalls is this black Ferrari with the license plate Red Rocker. So I'm like, and I knew he and Sam were tight, good buds. And uh, so I walk in, and Emeril sits me in a chair, kind of between him and Sam, and we just started talking. Were you a little and bit Kari starstruck? Was, uh, yeah. Just because but I, you were a fan, you liked music? Yeah, and, and I started drinking a lot, because I'd seen <laughs> Sammy with, like, What were you drinking? Ben Hay we, oh, we had a bunch of old William Salyum wines. Uh -huh. I brought some Magnums, and, I mean, they were drinking it like water, so I'm like, let's just keep going. And... Sam and Kari's main house is in Mill Valley, uh -huh. so they're only about an hour away. And just over the years, we were at auction events. We've been to their house in Cabo for some auction events. We've been to their house in, in Maui for some auction events. And you just build this relationship. I think Sam and Kari feel really comfortable with us because we're just us. Like, I'm not out to impress Sam about anything, and he loves the wines yeah, I make. Yeah, you're just a Central Valley guy. Yeah, I'm a I'm he a loves to Escalon make wine. boy, right? Yeah, that likes that, that goes to PBR. I know exactly. Right? But listens to a lot of rock <laughs> know, and roll from it. the '60s and '70s. So uh, we ended up doing a uh, winemaker dinner down at his restaurant, El Paseo, Sam's restaurant, and I found I've got all these old concert shirts, and it was like from 1979 or 1980, and it was. Sammy Hagar on the 4th of July, 1980. And he was the headliner with Blue Oyster Cult and Ario Speedwagon. So you, you found your old So I found this shirt. Well, no, no, no. I have totes of old concert shirts at my house, like from the 70s that you, even. That, uh, concerts that you will, I went that to. That you will not get rid of? No. Ever. And <laughs> some of them, like that one, you know, was like a large, and I'm, I'm like a double X now, you know. Yeah, or, you know, at least a large. Yeah, 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 yeah right. I understand. So I just said, you know, to the group as we were talking, you know, Sam got up and talked, and I just said, you know, this relationship has kind of come a long way. Because I was like 16 years old when I first listened to Montrose yeah. and saw Sammy at the Civic Auditorium in Stockton for $4.50. And, and then I brought out this t-shirt and I said, and then he was headlining at Day on the Green and he just turned, the red rocker turned red <laughs> at that point. And, you know, I think that there's just a mutual a admiration. I think he's just a wonderful person. Well, he, 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 he really has taught me a lot about philanthropy and giving back to people, you know, and being grateful for what you have. 
and and that's and Emerald has too actually. But I'm and, sure and I think that's what what has kind of influenced me to to start the Bob Cabral brand. Well, and I think they also appreciate your your gift for making wine. They do. You know, that's a yeah. talent. You're, you know, you're when an you artist. show up with great wine, you're an and you're artist. sitting in Sam's kitchen table, and he gets in a we're all in flip flops and t-shirts and shorts and he gets an acoustic guitar and it's one in the morning wow you're drinking that is cool hirsch from a magnum <laughs> shooting it with cabo wabo blanco and he's blanco. playing music and you know that's beautiful there's a there's a uh, right. you know music and wine and food and i think that's why i've connected with these guys is mm -hmm. that those three things can really bring oh, yeah. bring it together you know, you're touching all the senses from taste, smell, sight, hearing. And, and, and that's, that's it's, what it's I'm all, trying to do with my wines. Yeah, is, it's sensory. There's no it question. Is. It's all sensory. Yeah. Well, and you, yet you're, I think you're accomplishing that with your wine, too. Um, don't we have, do we have some photos of the, I, I heard about the wine my cave? My wine cave, yeah. So I have a, a wine, uh, now, a wine you, room that I, I turned an old living room. Oh, so I've got wow. a bunch of signed guitars by all these artists that I was at the, the shows. How many and, guitars uh, do you have? Oh, there's probably, I probably have close to a dozen and a half, two dozen. And um, look, all your student loan money is displayed. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I learned early on as a uh, young winemaker that anytime you were negotiating a salary, I always wanted wine too. So like when I negotiated the William Selliam oh. job, I said, I want a case of everything I make. Cause I'm spending Very like eight ass. grand a year buying this stuff yeah. and you right. can pay a, me, mm -hmm. you can pay me in wine. Yeah. So well, there's guitars, that one there, it was done by Steve Miller. Okay. It was on his tour bus for like two days and he sat there and decorated it with, with pins and all the way up the frets <laughs> and Oh, well, and he, he was, was opening up for, yeah. I mean, and, he was on the bus, that's funny. Yeah, it would, you know, um, that was one of the original guitars signed by the whole band at heart, Anna and Nancy Wilson. We were selling wine, Journey. So you've met Sammy. all of these people? Yeah, no, they, I was there when they, Jeff Beck signed a guitar oh, for me. Major. Wow. He was at the LBC, yeah. Wow. Ask Guy Davis about that one. He, Guy, I got the tickets. And I didn't know if we were actually going to get to meet Jeff Guy Davis Beck. is a winemaker, he's a friend of ours. So <laughs> I invited Guy to go with us, but I didn't tell him that we might. So when I got the tickets at Will Call, I go, oh, what are these? And they were backstage passes. And then Guy looked at me and I go, so I've got some guitars in my car and we're supposed to meet his manager out this side door and we get to meet Jeff Beck tonight. Guy's <laughs> eyes got really big. Uh, I don't even remember who opened up for him, but during the intermission, Guy bought one of his Blow by Blow albums. They were selling CDs, but he bought the vinyl. Yeah. And he goes, do you think he would sign this too? So I went back to get the guitar signed, and he signed Blow by Blow to Guy. And Guy, wow. Guy's like my brother. I mean, I love that. Well, he another, is such another a good guy. Down to earth yeah. guy, and he's it's Guy Davis Wines, by the way. Davis Wines. If if anything, you do owe yourself to try not only Susie's wines but Guy Davis's yeah. wines. He is he's just a a really good guy. Yeah, and his wines are delicious. And his wines are spectacular. I say yeah. that it, yeah. his winemaking reminds me of my own winemaking, so I'm being slightly <laughs> egotistical. I do love his wines, <laughs> and he doesn't. What take, you do? He doesn't do. I, I guarantee you, guy, and I don't do what you do. We're not. Yeah, we're but, not the but, risk takers you are, but. But, but we yeah. all get to the same point. Yeah, we do. And that's that's the great thing about winemaking is we we all get to the you know making delicious wines. It's like making really great food. I think a lot of chefs get there in different paths. But it's all really good food. So, so, um, so the brand Bob Cabral Wines, just to, to give everybody a little bit of idea. So when you're, you're spending $75 <laughs> for a, a bottle of rosé. Which is really just to make fun of the French. That's worth yeah, at least to, 85 uh, yeah. or 90 Yeah, I should probably double the price on that. I think so. But, you know, while I do think Troubadour, I do think the wines are worth that. I, I think I put, you, you actually do get a, a piece of my soul as as I, I feel I, as I make craft these wines. But when Heather and I decided to start Bob Cabral Wines, I had a couple of conditions. 
And one was that we would own the brand. So guys like Sammy and Emerald had offered us lots of money to, to, be to build a winery and be a partner. And, and while it was very humbling, um, I never wanted money to ever get away in, 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 infused into a friendship. And the, they, they, meant, they mean more to me as friends than any amount of money I could ever make with them. Although I wish I did some spirits with Sammy. He seems to have the golden touch. Um, so if you're watching this, Sam, market, when you're ready to make some spirits, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally up for the spirits deal. I've got some great barrels for tequila. Uh, so we would own the brand. I was only going to put so much money into it. Uh, Heather would do all the marketing and try and keep the list going, talk to the consumers, make sure that the wines got to them. I would do all the winemaking, no questions asked about what I was spending on barrels or grapes or glass labels, anything like that. And then most importantly, we wouldn't take any salaries. Nobody gets paid for this other than anything we farm out but to. But it's just you and Heather, it's correct? Just, yeah, but I use some compliance people for some certain okay, things. Okay, well, that and, that's a little outsourcing. You know, that does, I, you yeah. know, I noticed on your website it says, um, for any questions at all, call Heather. Yeah, <laughs> you do. It's say, like, call Heather. It doesn't Heather. even say call Heather to Cabral. It just yeah. says Heather. Heather. Call just Heather for call any Heather. questions, for any orders. Here's her cell phone and number. And I was thinking, I, yeah. I said, it's call yeah. her any time, day or night, yeah. call Heather. And she and, does. And she I answers was, her phone <laughs> 10 o'clock at night. Bob Cabral I know, lines. I, I was looking at that. I was looking at that going, wow, you know, that's a real family operation. <laughs> totally. And then when we can't get into... Um, Male chimp and things like that. <laughs> or we call yeah. we call Paige and like help. How do we put this Paige photo in here? So, right. so your technical consultant is your is our daughter. Is your yeah, but she's eighteen year old daughter <laughs> who gets to go to college in Portland now. So she's only a cell phone away. She's only a cell phone away. Um, and then the the kicker to it all was anything after operating expenses we would use to give back to children in need. Um, schools, children in crises, and to the community. And unfortunately now, like we're experiencing currently, no. we've had to give back to fires. So like after the, the Tubbs fire, Paige and I grabbed the checkbook and we went down to Safeway. And the poor lady at Safeway, we bought like $5,000 worth of gift cards to Target. Like That's fabulous. $100 gift cards, because I, I asked a few different people that were running these um, uh, donation centers. What do people need? And it's like, well, we got plenty of shoes and socks. They want to buy their own toothpaste and their own toothbrush and mm -hmm. their own Irish spring, right? So th they said gift cards to like Target or Walmart or someplace like that. So we bought a bunch of these gift cards and then took them down to a hub at Sonoma Country Day School where I'm still a trustee down there. And they were just so, and Paige, you know, was able to give them to, to the folks there. And, you know, people were just so grateful. Wow. So that's kind of what this is all about is I'm trying to find a sustainable way to give back to various communities that, that have always been so great to us. Well, good for you, yeah. Bob. So, if you're spending the the 125 on a troubadour, just know that it doesn't cost me that to make it. Although, it's a lot more than you would think. Um, but you're buying into philanthropy. You know what? I, I you're, you're buying into it, to giving back. You know, it, it doesn't yeah. matter. So I I will. This wine is is yeah. well. Well, I wanted really good wines too, so I, I felt that if you were gonna oh, pay no, that price, fabulous. you needed super good wines. Well, and, and you're, it's it's a it's a step it's it's a Burgundian a true Burgundy style wine. So beautiful. Well, beautiful. That's exactly yeah. how I would describe thank all you. your wines. Yeah, thank you. So you know, I think you can make Burgundian style wines in California. You know, go to Burgundy if you like Burgundy. Go to Burgundy or you go to Alsace for Alsatian wines, but we can make some really good well, I crafted say wines here in California. Support California if you like Burgundies, and this gentleman <laughs> is the best way to do that.
So, Bob, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. And all of your stories, and thank you, Heather. Crazy stuff, yeah. I know. And we will be back next week. Go to bobcabral.com. Bobcabralwines.com. Oh, excuse me, bobcabralwines.com. Yeah. Um, or order. just call Heather. Or, oh, yeah, call Heather. Can, yeah. can you put her cell number sure. on the bottom of the 707 screen? 707-321-5148. <laughs> That's 707 <laughs> Three, two, one, five, one, four, eight. Twenty-four-seven, correct? She'll help you out anytime. Okay. Well, thank you again for being here, and we will see. I think you. I'm in big trouble. <laughs> we will see you next week in the Selby Courtyard, and until then, cheers. Enjoy cheers. wine. Enjoy life. <laughs>